We back team recap today. We talking about the San Fran Kittle 49ers. How you doing, Mike? That was so bad. Like they're just getting worse and worse. Uh, but I'm I'm doing I'm doing good. How about yourself? I'm hanging in there. Just bought a new car, so we keeping it. We moving. We moving. And I guess with that being said, we'll move right into the 49ers draft class. So Mike, obviously there's not a bunch here to break down, but what are kind of your thoughts on, especially Kittle and Aya? Yeah, I think uh, when you're a team like the 49ers, who obviously a uh, pretty good team last year, um, you don't need much. And, and I love actually seeing how, how they, they don't really have too many picks. They don't have a huge quantity because they don't need quantity. Uh, if they had quantity, most of them are going to get cut or make practice squad if they make practice squad. So I like how they went for quality, not quantity. And first two picks are quality. I think Javon Kinlaw, uh, it's hard to argue he wasn't the second best you, you really can't argue he was, he was the second best D tackle uh, in this draft. You could even argue maybe number one if you're looking for more athletic, pass rushing, first step, one gap penetrator. Um, I think obviously just talent there. Uh, I think the question is uh, what you had to give up with to get that pick, to get Kinlaw. Uh, what you had to give up was DeForest Buckner. Um, obviously, that's more of a contract situation. I don't think they obviously had a reek – and DeForest coming up uh, a week before DeForest, but they didn't want to pay him. And obviously he, the market showed what he was worth, $20 million for DeForest. Um, so I, I guess I understand it there. I just wish they didn't pay a reek 17, but we'll get into that more when we talk about the defense. Uh, just a solid pick overall. No, I agree. And, you know, before we just talk about picking Kinlaw, let's talk about how they got to the Kinlaw pick because that was some fantastic stuff by John Lynch. For, for people who either forgot or didn't watch, the, the 49ers had the 13th pick. And essentially how it went was Tristan Wirfs was on the board. You still had C.D. Lamb. You still had Jerry Judy. You still had Kinlaw. So the 49ers having minimal holes, as you said, they're basically able to sit there and say, hey, like we are going to take Tristan Wirfs unless you want to trade up and get him. But we'll also take any of those other guys. So it's like they have no – there was no downside to them moving down a slot and the upside was picking up a fourth-round pick that they then packaged with, I believe, 196 to move from 31 to 25 to get their guy in Brandon Ayo. That was just great GMing by John Lynch because, obviously, you didn't have a bunch of draft capital. So you just you basically made a pick appear out of nowhere, just like they did with the Mitch Trubisky trade a couple years back. They do it again here. Great stuff. In terms of Kinwa's potential, I'm a huge fan. I think that in a normal class, this one was kind of stacked. In a normal class, he would have been – kind of a top seven, eight player in the class, honestly. He, he's usually a DT1 with, with kind of, as you said, his first step, but also what he offers in the run game. He, he's so stout. And he, has, he plays with really good leverage. He has good hands and really just a solid player. And especially putting him into this situation around that other collection of guys, which we'll get to in a couple of minutes, it's just, it's a home run, you know. And then with Ayuk, I know there's some, there's some questions there because there were a bunch of receivers. You, you kind of wonder if they w- would have been able to sit at 31 and get him, but with teams like the Packers picking between them, and you really didn't know, or the, or the, or the Ravens, you didn't know if someone else was going to go and get their guy. I know some people think that he might not be the best out of like the Pittmans and Higgins, and even compared to like Jefferson and Rieger. Personally, I, I thought he was my fourth best receiver in the class. He, he reminds me a lot of kind of Sammy Watkins at Clemson a couple of years ago where he just, you know, he's got really solid size. He's not crazy tall. He's not crazy short. And, and he's a, he's a pretty good route runner. He's just pretty good at everything. You know, he's, he's not crazy athletic. I believe I ran a four or five, but just the way he gets in and out of cuts and even on deep routes, especially like his ability to somehow just stack these cornerbacks and get the, get, you know, a step or two on the deep ball. I believe in the three games I watched most recently, he drew, I think, six pass interferences deep just because he would get a step, two steps, sometimes even three steps on defenders and really force them to kind of sell out to try and catch up. And, and with that and, you know, kind of aided by some, some badly thrown balls underneath, he was able to draw flags. And I don't, I don't know if that will translate perfectly to the next level, but even if it doesn't, just his ability to make plays after the ball is, is in his hands. He, he kind of reminds me of almost a mini CD lamb in terms of, like, his rack ability. And not like trucking over guys, obviously, but just his ability to run through tackles, you know. So, so I think that that's going to be a really interesting addition, especially when you lose a guy like Emmanuel Sanders. I think that that's a really solid pick. Yeah, I think going from that, solid picks. Let's see how they actually stack up on the offense. Well, at so, least one of them. 
no, so I mean, right away, I guess, I guess you could say two of them technically because we, we forgot to mention that they did trade picks for Trent Williams, obviously, to replace Joe Staley at left tackle. So, Mike, obviously they don't have many other additions than Ayuk and Trent, but what are kind of your general thoughts on what this offense is going to bring in 2020? Yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, obviously, they were run first team last year, and we we're seeing a lot of the same backs right there, obviously, minus Matt Breda. Um, it, it'll be interesting to see. Like, obviously, late in the season, uh, Mostert kind of started becoming not a bell cow, but like kind of the top guy in that running back uh, core. So, I, I'm interested to see, like, will he make the next transition? Will he be a thousand yard rusher? Uh, will he be not, not necessarily a bell cow? I'm trying to think of a word, but definitely the number one option for that team. Um, Obviously, Tevin Coleman had some injury concerns last year, but when he played, man, he he, he played. Uh, and Jarek McKinnon coming back. Um, I don't think he'll be a, a huge difference maker. Um, he might actually be cut uh, with Jefferson. So I think it's an interesting running back core, but I think really where the questions lie, obviously the offensive line really isn't a question, but I think those wide receivers, I think they're questionable to say the least. Obviously, Debo Samuel was kind of a good little Swiss Army knife uh, kind of a uh, little bit of do-it-all player, um, but he really now has to do it all. Um, unless you expect Ayuk to step in day one and be a, a large contributor, which, which is something we usually don't see from late pick in the first round wide receivers, it's going to be a development. So um, Jalen Hurd's an interesting player. Uh, he, he might be a pretty good third, fourth option. I think they have a, a really interesting class of wide receivers. Five pretty good options, none great. And I'm interested to see how that kind of plays out. Uh, and if it's going to be a problem for them. No, I agree. I, th I think that with their wide receiver room, the only problem is how different are their skill sets? You know, I, as much as I like Ayuk, a lot of the things that he does are really kind of reminiscent of what Debo does in a way. You know, a lot of the, a lot of the routes that he ran at Arizona State were just simple, you know, bubble screens that he's going he's gonna to take for 15 yards. Well, that's kind of already Debo's role on this team as well as Kendrick Bournes and Dante Pettis. Is obviously, they've had larger roles in the past, but they really haven't done much to kind of differentiate themselves from a standard average replacement wide receiver. The one thing that I did want to say, though, about that offensive line, I know you mentioned it won't be a question. I, I think it could be a question, I'll say, because you lose, you lose Joe Staley, and I believe you upgrade from Joe Staley, but we haven't seen Trent Williams play in a year, so that's a, that's a little bit of a question mark. And then more so the bigger questions at right guard. Tom Compton, he – According to PFF, graded horribly last year. I believe he was in the 40s, which which just isn't ideal. He's replacing Mike Person, and I just don't know if that's gonna if that's gonna do the job, especially if you do plan to be a team that runs the ball 20, 30 times a game. So one kind of free agent signing that I thought would be interesting. I know they have I believe 15 million cap space. I think a guy like Larry Warford would be really interesting. Of course, him and uh, Lincoln Tomlinson, the the wannabe neurologist, linking back up from their days in Detroit. That 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 would be a an interesting combo because it kind of flopped in Detroit. But I do think that in this kind of run-heavy scheme that that, that that would work out really well and give them another veteran presence on this offensive line. Yeah, so they do have a little bit of cap. Um, Warford makes sense, but uh, maybe another option to use that cap is to sign George Kittle for an extension. Obviously, he's kind of been, as, as much as we talk about those wide receivers, really none of them have been the number one option because Kittle has, and I, I, I apologize, I failed to mention that before, uh, we were – he was kind of one of our dogs in the draft. Uh, Lions were in need of a tight end. George Kittle was our guy. One time I remember just telling Prevo, just put on this film. Just put on this guy, George Kittle, just watch it. I can't say I've ever – I don't think me and you have ever enjoyed college film as much as George Kittle. It was just one of those ones. We kind of knew it. Uh, I'm not trying to toot our horn or anything, but he's a difference maker. Not only is he receiving option, and by far – uh, top two at the tight end position. If not number one, you could argue him and Kelsey all day. Uh, watch this man run block. I think that's that's the one thing that stuck out when we were watching film is, man, this man just straight up was trucking people. Uh, he has no problem getting in there, uh, taking on DNs, linebackers, and, and making an impact block and making sometimes the gap or the hole that a lot of these running backs are making those plays off of. So I think he is super important and probably with some of that cash – right now should go to no and you talk about him in college the thing with him in college is he was great run block and that's kind of what put him on our radar and then you realize as you watch him more he didn't get targeted a bunch but when he did man he was he was very sure-handed and you saw you saw flashes of what he could do after the catch and I do think that kind of in the pros he has stepped that up not even one two maybe even three levels 
because now he's one of the best rack, rack guys in the entire league, especially considering he's a tight end. But that's just, just a great pick. The only question I have to you now that he is coming to the end of his rookie deal is I know you said to re-sign him. What would you re-sign a tight end for like that? Because obviously Kittle is kind of – we haven't seen somebody like him, at least in a while. I know Travis Kelsey is probably the closest guy. But I believe right now the most any tight end is making is $11 million. So what would you pay Kittle? I know some people are saying that he's going to be 20-plus. So where do you kind of fall on this? It's hard, it's hard to say. I don't think he's 20-plus. I really don't. Obviously, some top-end wide receivers – are at that point, and I think that's where he wants to be. He's he's kind of kind of a lot of with that running back uh, kind of argument with a lot of those coming up with the, after their rookie contracts. They're like, I'm more than some of these wide receivers getting paid fifteen, sixteen, seventeen million dollars, and they're not even having an impact on the team that I am for this team. And I think George Kittle's kind of probably that same argument. Um, but I, I think if you could try to settle somewhere, obviously he should be paid similar to a wide receiver. I'm not sure top end wide receiver. I think if you can get him somewhere in that 16, 17 mil range, I think that's where he belongs. I think for that, his well-rounded game, his ability to block in the run, and obviously just as a pass catching option, uh, he, he gets more yards and has more impact plays than any wide receiver on this roster. So I think it's, it's really hard not to say he's, he's not worth at least right around that range for what he does for this offense. No, I, I agree. And, when you, when you think about it, though, the question is, obviously, maybe maybe he's not a high-end wide receiver, like you said, but he run blocks more than any wide receiver could in their wild streams, you know? So the question is just how much is that worth? Are you going to pay him like a mid-end receiver and then a top-end tight end and kind of smash that together? The only problem that I have with it is, man, if you pay George Kittle like $20 million, between him and Jimmy G, you're paying the two of them basically $50 million. You know, that's 25% of your cap space on two guys. And obviously Kittle is an elite tight end. He, he's either one or two. And personally, I don't really think he's two. But Jimmy G is not a top 15 quarterback, I don't think. It may be top 20. That, that's kind of that's where he falls, you know. So having 50 mil just between those two guys, you really begin to question is can you re-sign Kittle if Jimmy G is your long-term option? You know, so the next thing that I wanted to bring up that I found really interesting looking into their cap situation was how John Lynch kind of front-loaded Jimmy G's deal to the point where after, the, after this upcoming season, he only has $2 million guaranteed left for the next two years. You could essentially cut him and have $2 million in dead cap. So, obviously, you wouldn't think of them trading Jimmy G, you know. Obviously, like, I don't think they planned on cutting him or trading him when, when they got him from New England. But, but there is some credence in maybe we pay Kittle the $20 million, we eat the bullet this upcoming season when they're both making a ton of money, and then we bring our replacement rookie or young quarterback in that's not making a lot of money, and he's going to have the best tight end in football to throw to. You know, so I do think that there is some credence in that. And maybe even though we're looking at this team right now as if Jimmy G is the long-term guy here, maybe he's not actually. And instead, a guy like Kittle and some more weapons are to a, to a younger quarterback here in maybe just a year, you know? Yeah, I think it, this team made it to the Super Bowl last year with Jimmy G. Like, How much did Jimmy G really elevate this team? I, I don't think very much. I think an interesting guy, just kind of like I'm trying to use like as a comp, like comparative, would Jacoby and Brissett made the same impact on this team as Jimmy Garoppolo? I honestly think it's very comparable. If not, I think early on the season, you probably saw a little bit more from Brissett. Um, obviously, Jimmy G was coming off the injury a little bit fresh coming back, but like I really do feel like you could put a pretty average start. Well, they have a pretty average starting quarterback, and they made it to the Super Bowl. Uh, so I really don't understand the purpose of paying Jimmy G top quarterback money because he's not a top end, top tier quarterback. No, and I think that when you got him and you gave him this extension, you were hoping that he would progress and become at least to like the caliber of a Kirk Cousins or Matt Stafford or somebody at the high end of the, at least the teens or, you know, nine, 10, somewhere in that range. But I, he just hasn't, he hasn't showed it, you know, and maybe that's a part of the front office's fault because you haven't given, given him that many weapons at receiver. Obviously, now you've, you've lost one in Emmanuel and brought one in in Aya, but he doesn't have the best receiving course. So maybe it's a little bit of the front office's fault, but personally, I just, I just think it's Jimmy G. You know, at the end of the day, I just think that he's kind of at his ceiling, and he is what he is. Take it or leave it. I don't, I don't know if I'd go as far to say that, oh, you know, they could have won the Super Bowl with a Jacoby Brissett, but honestly, if, if they did have a guy like a Teddy Bridgewater or Ryan Tannehill who, who's kind of in that same range and not making – nearly as much money, or at least they weren't. I know Tannehill is now. <laughs> I, I think that, you, you know, the questions are there. 
So could they could they replace Jimmy G with a guy like that after next season, or could they just straight up draft a guy and just surround a rookie quarterback with enough talent? I think they kind of could because there's outside maybe right guard, like I said, another receiver. There's not that many holes in this offense. No, for sure. And I think talking about not too many holes, uh, the defense. So I'm gonna start with you. Your your thoughts on that that front set? We'll go seven because I think that's really. Uh, it really kind of – well, you could go front 11, to be honest with you. But front seven, uh, some of your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is probably – even even in losing to Forrest Buckner, this is, if not the best front seven in the NFL, this is probably top top five, pretty easily top five. I mean, I don't know very many teams that could just up and lose an elite defensive tackle and just everything proceeds as normal, you know. I think that we saw what Nick Bosa did last year. The man's an absolute animal. He might even be better than his brother, honestly. I don't think that that's too far-fetched to say. A guy like Eric Armstead, like you said, uh, kind of questionable to me. Didn't know of him coming out of Oregon. Didn't know of really what we saw for the first three years in his NFL career, you know. He didn't have any seasons over, I, I think, 19 tackles or three sacks. And all of a sudden last year, he had 10, he had 10 sacks and bumped that tackle production up. But I do think that if it feels up to me, I would have tried to – you know, try and trade a reek to somebody and maintain DeForest on the team because DeForest, from day one, he's never had a season with less than 60 tackles, and he can be right there in terms of sack production. Um, but but I just I just love it. I mean, D Ford, I think that here he's he's almost underused because he's kind of he's more of a rotational guy than anything. When they're when they're just playing base defense, Dre Greenlaw is actually in more as that coverage linebacker alongside Quan and Fred Warner. And when he's rushing the passer, obviously he's still incredibly effective. I know one real interesting guy that I did really like coming out of the draft that I hope we see used in the right mold now is with, you know, with the absence of DeForest is a guy like Solomon Thomas. Him coming out of Stanford, he was a super explosive interior defensive lineman when they used him there. But the question was, where would he play in the NFL? And I think that we're to the point where we've seen this man's not an edge player. He He just doesn't have enough. He doesn't have a quick enough first step. He doesn't have the bend to play that five tech, that six tech, whatever you want to call him, just that, that wide nine, anything. Put him as a three tech and just let him, just let him go crazy because he is more explosive than guard, most guards and interior offensive linemen. So I'd love to see him kind of take over some of that role now that DeForest is gone, and I really do think that might be their next breakout player here. Yeah, for sure. I guess with the loss of DeForest Bunker, I think the prop – my problem with this front seven is they really don't have a space eater. DeForest Buckner, obviously, obviously you, you know a lot about his penetration, his ba- kind of his ability to tackle. I think that kind of speaks for it. He might have had just kind of a le- more not lean, but he's 6'8", like 290, 300 body type. But, man, he played like a true like one tech sometimes. He just ate up space. His length just kind of he, – he could double gap. And you just it's just kind of funny thing to see from hit that a player that – of his like kind of size and athleticism. Uh, he kind of was a do-it-all player for this defense, and they don't have that necessarily. Solomon Thomas and Kinlaw are both best utilized as a, a one-gap penetrating D-tackle. They really don't have that space eater, and DeForest Buckner kind of could do it all and was a lot of times that space eater for this defense. But they're so, they're so talented with the rest, all five of them, to be honest. Uh, there shouldn't be too many issues. Uh, you're basically, if you just covered five gaps, put these five players, lined them up, uh, I, I, I take the defense over the offense. And that's basically what they're going to do. They're going to cause disruption, allow those linebackers to get to the running backs, create those gaps for them. So uh, I really don't have an issue, but that's a kind of one question I have to see how this defense looks without DeForest. But kind of going off that, maybe what are some of your thoughts on this secondary? You know, I'm not as high on the secondary – as some people are, I know, you know PFF last year at one point said that Sherman Witherspoon and Kawan were all top 10 corners in the NFL. And uh, I think that's kind of really funny. Personally, I don't think that that's uh, factual. But nonetheless, with this front seven, maybe they played like it because they didn't have to cover very long. That's besides the point. Well, one thing that I, I have to say about it is, obviously, we know what Richard Sherman can do. But how long is he going to be able to sustain that level of play? I know I'm a little bit higher on Richard than you are. We, we've been kind of arguing through our top 100 list, and I would say Richard Sherman is still 
he's definitely not the top cornerback in the league, but I think he's right there in the discussion at number two. I know you're a little bit lower on him than that, but really my question is, what is this team going to do going forward? So after this upcoming season, Sherman, Witherspoon, Kawan, Barrett, and Tart are all free agents. That's a big, you know, that, there's a lot of turnover that might happen there. And especially if you pay a guy like Kittle, now how much are you, are you going to be able to retain whatever, Akella Witherspoon for whatever he wants? You know, that's, that's the question. Are you going to, are you going to be able to retain Kawan Williams if you even want to, honestly, because I do think that his grades are a little bit inflated by the rest of this team. It's just a question of, is this a sustainable secondary? I have no problem with it for next year, obviously, but is it going to be sustainable past that, I guess? I think that's a really good question. I think, especially with cornerback, it's, it's, it's an expensive position to replace if they had to replace them, or it's going to be an expensive position to keep what you have, to retain your talent. Uh, that's a good question. I really don't know where they go for it. Uh, and obviously it's not an easy one to even fit and, and kind of find in the draft. Uh, as most – you know, first round, uh, second round corners, it takes them a couple years to develop unless you want some below mediocre talent play in there. Uh, so I think it's a great question. I don't know where they fill it. Um, obviously, Jason Verrett, maybe he's kind of their fourth option now, but uh, pre-injuries, uh, and he's had a lot to say the least. Uh, he was not a top tier corner, but uh, he was right out. He was kind of leaning that way. Really solid foundational piece. So uh, I guess that might be a cheap option they kind of already have on the roster. Um, but, yeah, no, I don't think that's a great one, to be honest. I just kind of threw it out there. Um, no. Uh, could they be a team that kind of ends up with some Nevin Lawsons or, uh, or, or players like that in their secondary next year? And like You likely could see that, them trying to kind of go budget corner, and it just seldomly works in this league. So, no, I, I agree it's a concern for next year, but um, – yeah, I guess get there next year. It's kind of hard. You really get – I don't see how they can work around it. Either extend some of them this year, use some of that cap if you don't do Kittle or, or try to do a little bit of both, or you're going to try to do a patch job. No, and, and I agree. You'll cross the road when you get there, obviously. But it is, it is just tough when, you know, a lot of people think that corner might be one of the top two or three most valuable positions in the NFL right now just because of how pass-centric the league is. The only kind of hope that I'll offer them is that with this front four, front five, you might not need the best corners, you know, and I don't think they have them now, but those guys are elevated by their situation. I think that you could maybe put some, you know, just above average corners in there if they had to replace a guy like Sherman or replace a guy like Akello, and their play could be elevated just as much considering that you have elite edge rushers like Bosa, like D Ford, or interior guys more like Eric and, and potentially Kendall and Thomas rushing the passer as well. So with that being said, Mike, you ready to get to the schedule? Let's get it. All right. So we've been kind of talking about the Vegas odds. So Vegas has the 49ers at 10 and a half wins, Mike. They are projected for the most in the NFC West. Do you fall on that right away? It's hard. It's, it's a tough division. I think this, this division was definitely elevated. Um, I think the Cardinals are now a true – true contender um, I, I maybe I hate to say that because I, I don't know how I feel about the Seahawks and the Rams to be honest they might be right where they were before um, but tough division 10 and a half might be cut a little it's probably right where I feel they should be 10 to 11 I think it's probably where I see them falling um, so it's hard to be over under when you're right on the dot so um, yeah I'll, I'll say probably the over I'll say that a lot of these non-division games are pretty easy. They should start off pretty hot, and hopefully they can keep that going into maybe the tougher back end of the schedule. Yeah, no, see, I'm going to you know, I'm gonna take the opposite stance. I think that I agree that the first half of the schedule is really easy. I think you might see this team win six or maybe even seven games you know, for, between, like, weeks one and eight. But then after that, they kind of did get a raw draw considering you have to face the Packers and the Saints. I know nobody else in their division – has to face like two great teams like that. Obviously, if they had a second place schedule, it would be the Falcons and the Vikings, or either the Bears and the Bucks. So they kind of got the worst draw. But that, just that really, that stretch of games there between, as I said, Packers, Saints, and then Rams and Bills, and then Cowboys after that could be a tough one. And then you have two division games to close the close the season. It's just a real tough back kind of back half of the schedule. 
And I wouldn't be shocked if they finished around nine wins. Honestly, I, I really wouldn't. I, I think that losing DeForest and picking Arik over DeForest is going to have more negative implications than a lot of people think. I think that losing a guy like Emmanuel Sanders, even though they're replacing him with a rookie receiver in Ayuk, and I know we've seen a lot of rookie receivers kind of kind of pop off early in their career. Obviously, like the DJ Sharks, DJ Moores, Corwin Suttons, we've seen them, you know, hit the ground running. Ayuk could do that, but but still, a guy like Emmanuel Sanders was really solid for this team when he was healthy playing last season. So I'll probably end up below nine, but I guess what I'll ask you is our kind of our typical question. What is one or two games that really stand out to you here? Yeah, I think a game you said um, might be a tough matchup. I think it is a tough matchup. It can speak a lot for, for the NFC as a whole. Uh, week 15, Cowboys. I think that's going to be a huge game. Uh, both super talented teams, uh, some stack rosters, probably two of the top tier in the NFC. Uh, so that's going to be a fun game to watch. Will it have playoff intentions at that point? Probably. Uh, likely. They both might be battling for a spot in the playoffs. Um, they both could be battling wild cards. They both can be bat- battling for their divisions. I don't know where either of those teams are going to end up by that point, uh, but that could be a big game with, the, with a lot of impacts in the playoffs. Uh, and then I think lastly, when that sticks out, it might be, it might be for the division week 17 Seahawks. That could be a huge game. Uh, it might be probably one of the biggest in week 17. If it comes down to that, uh, it should be a pretty tight race. Yeah, obviously people weren't really expecting it last year as they went from worst to first or not literally, but pretty damn close. Um, but that 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 game could have a lot of playoff implications. Um, I think these – they both could really be in the spot right there. I think both of them probably will make the playoffs. One is a wild card, one just straight-up division winner. Uh, that might be the game that settles it. And uh, I'm hoping to see that. That would be a fun game to watch. I know I, I mean you'll be tuned in for that. Uh, that that's some old-school football. Strong front seven, big time running games. Uh, I think that'd be a matchup, obviously worth watching. It might be probably one of the best one if it comes down to that. Might be one of the best ones in the regular season. No, I completely agree. I mean, we saw it. We saw it late in the season this year. It just when you put such an elite front seven like the 49ers have to offer against what I believe to be the best quarterback under pressure in the NFL in Russell Wilson, it's just it's going to be an explosive and really fun to watch matchup. The only other one that I'll offer is, I kind of alluded to it before, is that Saints game in, in New Orleans. Obviously, I think uh, a couple of videos ago when we did the Saints, we said that we believe the Saints are one of, if not the best team in the NFC, at least on paper. And I think that that'll be a great test to see kind of how, you know, how who we think might be the NFC champions this year stack up against who it was last year. So I think that that will be a really good game to watch. But speaking of good stuff to watch, obviously, if you guys are enjoying our team recap series, if you're liking what we do here, make sure you guys are leaving a like, commenting, and subscribing. I know, I know usually I say, like, hey, drop it in the comments who you want to see next. But, Mike, we don't, we don't really have very many teams left. I mean, we have, we have the Seahawks and then the AFC East. So I guess if you're a fan of, you know, any team in the AFC East, just, just drop them in the comments, and, and we'll prioritize that video. But – other than that, I don't, I don't really have much to say, Mike. Are you ready to get out of here or what? I think we mic'd up. We mic'd out. Deuces.